Hi, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this inaugural event in the uh, college's new lecture series on the history of education. We are delighted that you've joined us both here at the Oriental Institute and uh, remotely uh, through the webcast. I'm Daniel Kohler. I'm the Deputy Dean of the College for Academic Affairs, and I have the pleasure this evening of introducing our distinguished speakers, Dean John Boyer and Professor Martha Roth. And together, they're going to explore how the University of Chicago, or the history of the university, has shaped the institution that we inherit today, a university that transforms the individuals who study and teach here but also the world outside through the generation of new knowledge. So a bit about this evening's speakers. John Boyer is Dean of the University of Chicago College and the Martin A. Ryerson Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of History. Uh, during his six terms as Dean, John has led a renewal of the college across many domains, enriching our storied curriculum with new core courses and new programs of study, strengthening the college's admissions programs and creating many new opportunities to, for our students to, to deepen their studies. Uh, some of these are now treasured parts of the undergraduate experience. They involve foreign study, career and professional development, research opportunities, scholarly engagements with the city of Chicago, and uh, many other areas. John has also built a much stronger financial advising and programmatic support structure for our students and played a leading role in the founding and current expansion of the university's center in Paris. But of course, John is not only a figure in the university's recent history, he is also deservedly known as its most insightful analyst and its unofficial historian. A leading scholar of the Habsburg Empire and the author of numerous works, uh, in 2015, he published The University of Chicago, A History, which was itself a culmination of decades of deep archival research on the institutional, curricular, and financial evolution of the university. And this evening's discussion is going to draw upon the insights that we find in that book, which is going to be available for purchase uh, afterwards in, in the lobby. Um, our moderator this evening, Professor Martha T. Roth, is the Chauncey S. Boucher Distinguished Service Professor of Assyriology in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, the College and the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. She is also currently the Interim Director of the Greenberg Center for Jewish Studies. Martha has previously served as Dean of the Division of the Humanities, where she oversaw 18 degree granting programs, more than 200 faculty, 500 graduate students, 25 undergraduate majors, and 20 centers and institutes. She also served as Deputy Provost for Research and Education and Editor in Charge of the 26-volume Chicago Assyrian Dictionary. Martha has researched and published widely on the legal and social history of the ancient Near East, with a primary scholarly focus on family law and the compilation and transmission of legal norms. She is a board member of the Demos Foundation, the Newberry Library, and locally of the Seminary Co-op Bookstores. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Can you hear us okay? Can you hear me? Good, I just dropped it. Okay, we'll try again. There, now can you hear me? Great, thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, Dan, for those lovely words. Um, and thank you, John, for agreeing to do this and for talking with us all. Um, you know, John is a prominent historian of the Habsburg monarchy uh, from the uh, mid-17th century to the early 20th century, and anybody who knows anything about the Habsburgs or the Holy Roman Empire or Europe in those centuries will see how that scholarly background can prepare you for life in administration at the University of Chicago. Um, it also prepared him to understand and to see and to interpret the long arc of history here at the university that is so beautifully on display in his book, um, The University of Chicago, A History. I wanna come back to that indefinite article um, if I can later as well. Um, I wanna cover a couple of key points, I hope, this evening in our questions. First, we all um, 
know that the University of Chicago stands for something important. Uh, you write in your book, John, that the university's identity is profoundly interwoven <laughs> with its history. Um, and moreover, we know that the university has a powerful and distinctive identity. So this evening, I want us to consider what it is that makes that identity so distinctive and why that's important. Um, also, like uh, Habsburg history, the university often finds itself at inflection points. It seems like every generation a new crisis emerges and a new generation of leaders has to tackle it. Um, we have to struggle to maintain what's valuable from the past um, while also striving to lead the way into the future and being open to innovation and what can make the institution great in the future. Um, I hope we also get a chance to talk about you, John, as a scholar, teacher, administrator, uh, lifelong Chicagoan. Um, I'm particularly interested in seeing in our conversation how you are both a scholar and a participant. You're a historian of the University of Chicago and somebody who has shaped it so profoundly. And I think that's, I hope that all will come through um, in, in our conversation this afternoon or this evening. So let's start with the book itself. Um, thick, big, wonderful book, easy read. Um, don't let the size intimidate you. Um, John, you wrote uh, 15 or so smaller monographs uh, over the last couple of decades that were devoted to thematic slices of the university. And you looked at philanthropy through the ages, the trustees through the decades, and so forth. What decided, what made you decide that the entire story needed to be told at this time in particular when higher education and research general uh, universities and knowledge and facts are all under attack again? Would you expand a little bit on the idea that the University of Chicago and all great universities are national resources that need to be treasured and nurtured? Okay, um, well, uh, l l let me just begin by thanking um, the colleagues of, of the Oral Institute for letting us have this beautiful hall and, uh, and express my uh, admiration to Martha, who was a great dean of the humanities and a uh, very courageous dean, and also uh, anyone who can edit a 26 volume. Uh, Assyrian Dictionary. I mean, this this, this uh, work is one of the great monuments of um, of, uh, of, uh, of the kind of scholarship that William Rennie Harper, I think, sought to make uh, the kind of normative at the university. So uh, l l let, me, let me go back to the beginning, though. I, I, I got into writing the history of the university in, in a kind of curious way. Uh, it was the summer of 1996. The uh, then president, Hugo Sonnenschein, whose memorial service, uh, sadly, we just had um, this weekend, uh, had sent a letter to the faculty in, announcing his intent to expand the college. The college was about 3,400 students, and he proposed to add 1,000 students but for a, a number of reasons that uh, some people uh, thought were implausible, other people thought were compelling, and, and there was a great deal of tension. And people were coming to me saying, well, what is you, what, uh, as dean of the college, what do you think of this? And I, I said, well, uh, I kind of have to have an answer to that. Uh, you know, you, I was supposed to be dean of this place, uh, or I was dean of this place. And so uh, I did what historians usually do, is you go to the archives. Right. And I, I spent the summer rummaging around, uh, literally rummaging around the archives. And I found out that actually every president since L Lawrence Kempton had been actually been trying to expand the college to enormous mm -hmm. controversy, and that the controversy that Hugo had provoked with this letter, those of the more senior faculty in the room will, will, will remember this, was actually the latest installment in a series of really quite wonderful dramatic, uh, uh, torturous, uh, fruitful mm -hmm. confrontations with this demographic. So I wrote it up. And, uh, and the people who were opposed to Hugo found the, um, uh, the, the monograph somewhat inconvenient. I remember a friend of mine saying, taking me out for lunch and saying, you know, this, this is a really interesting monograph. It's not very helpful to us. <laughs> and I said, okay. Well, I said, well, yeah, but that's not what scholars do. We don't, we don't write things that are necessarily helpful. Uh, and so uh, then people would say, well, that, like, what's the next one going to be on? Like, you know, what next one? I just I did this because of, we were in the middle of this crisis. But then uh, the next year was the core, and I did one on the history of the curriculum, which was equally kind of both tortured and fascinating. Uh, and so you got into the room. So eventually, uh, it was my colleague, Ralph Lerner, who was uh, uh, in our in Committee of Social Thought, who basically said, John, you know, you've, you've got a book here somewhere, not in these individual monographs, but there's something there. Why don't you take a couple of years off from writing this big history of the Habsburg Empire, uh, which my editors at Oxford were not happy with, and uh, you know, why don't you try to do it? And so that's how I came to write the book. It was kind of written out of 
this engagement with being both a practitioner of higher education, but also being then a, a kind of sometimes mm -hmm. student. And, and it was quite fascinating because I had to teach myself something about the history of American higher education, because that's not where, you know, that's not, you're a seriologist and I was a half Right, <laughs> right, right, right. We're accidental, yeah, uh, accidental administrators, yeah, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. Um, do you think that, um, that international factors, um, wars, global issues, climate change, pandemics, um, are reflected in your history in, at these various moments? Uh, you know, I think the university was a global university from the very beginning. It, it, it didn't want to, I think, talk about itself in those ways. It would, I mean, those are our words. That, that would have mm -hmm. been Harper or his founding uh, generation's words. But they were uh, very ambitious people. These were the, the Baptist community that founded it with Rockefeller's money. Rockefeller had given them the, the money, I think, Assuming that he was founding a small but you know very nice college, and Rockefeller and Harper was able to persuade him to found a research university, and the, the, you know, the normative uh, models there were, were, were places like Berlin or Leipzig or mm -hmm. or, or, or Bonn or Vienna, and uh, and many of the young faculty, I think almost 40 percent of our faculty, and when we opened our doors, had been trained in Germany, and some of them had gone for longer times, some for shorter times, but they brought back these ideals. Uh, that the Germans had kind of created the flow out of the Humboldtian tradition, broadly conceived of economic freedom, of teaching, freedom of teaching and learning. And uh, these were designed for these large civil service oriented German universities, but the Americans, and we weren't the only ones, but I think we did it in a fairly unique way, found a way of taking those ideals and transplanting them to the Midwest. So in a way, the ideals were, were European or international. The teachers were international. Of course, the students were very local. I mean, most of our students until World War II came from you know, the Midwest, and many, most of our undergraduates came from the city of Chicago, and as all, all the universities in America were fairly regional places until after World War II. Um, and, and then the other, after World War I, you then have, you know, more foreign graduate students coming, more interchanged, especially Harper's journals and the press began to be really an international operation. And then finally, you know, the college begins to be international in, in, in a demographic sense after World War II. So this, this kind of waves, but it really begins with this idea of you know, we Americans can learn something from other cultures uh, and, and how to do this. And then I think by the 1920s and 30s, we're, we're self-confident enough that a place like the Oriental Institute becomes a destination. It's no longer a kind of learning enterprise, but it's a place of, of distinction unto itself right. in which other place, other countries are sending people here as right. opposed to we're going there. Yeah. And, and emulating what we do. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and over in, in the course of the history of, of the university, that reputation has... Um, had some flow, but it has been extremely prominent and on the rise in recent decades. Um, and we are now known for um, our stance on academic expression, freedom of expression, academic integrity, and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about how the University of Chicago has, has taken that role as leader in these positions? Uh, you know, I, I think the, um, it is true that the, uh, you know, there's a document that I'm sure most of the members of the audience have seen. It's called the Chicago Principles, which were authored by my our colleague Jeff Stone, a committee that Bob Zimmer appointed um, to, to create this document. But that document and the, the norms or values instantiated in that document really flow out of a century of, of what I would call cultural practice. And uh, it, in some ways, it goes back to the, the founding moment that if you're going to bring Distinguished researchers. I mean, most American colleges, including you know the, the antebellum colleges that become research universities at the end of the 19th century, different than Stanford and Chicago, places like Columbia and Harvard, um, they all kind of grow into being, to embracing these values of, of what the Germans would call uh, Lehrfreiheit and Lernfreiheit, economic freedom, um, and the practice thereof. And if you're going to bring people to do uh, you know superb work in chemistry or, or mm -hmm. seriology or history. Um, you, you, in a sense, have to give them the freedom to explore. Otherwise, they're, they're not going to stay. They won't do the best work. And Harper himself had some ambivalent attitudes about economic freedom because of the need to you know, raise money and so forth. That this was not a, a, a well-known value. It, it, it's been contested over the, over, over the, over the, the 20th century. But the, the power of the faculty, the power of people like Lawrence, J. Lawrence uh, Loughlin or Herman von Holst or uh, Burstead and so forth, insisting upon it really created a, the conditions of possibility that someone like Hutchins can come in in the 30s and mobilize it in a more popular way with the Walgreen affair and so forth. 
And then Hutch's genius was that, to realize that the students had to be part of this. this the, the, these traditions of, of free discourse could not simply be something that the, the faculty shared with themselves, but rather the students had to. In a sense, this was, it was either for the whole community or it, it, it didn't work for anybody. And so I think, um, in a sense, this has been kind of in our, in, in our bones, in our, in our, in our, in our DNA. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's been fairly uh, easy for us then to, you know, to talk about it, whether we can, whether other universities should do the same things that we do. I, it seems I'm a little bit skeptical. I think you have to find your own way. Uh -huh. Each institution has to find its own way toward this, these kind of patterns of, of free discourse. But for us, it's been a... It's really been a, a, a property that's been anchored in the senior faculty from day one and uh, been ferociously defended, ferociously Ferocious, defended. Ferocious, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And what about student expression? Um, you know, the... the you said, uh, yeah. The, uh, Hutchins was, um, who becomes president in 1929, this kind of young whippersnapper dean from, uh, from um, Yale who, uh, you know, wants to make a name for himself. I think Hutchins was a... A, a fellow who was, at least he felt when he walked in the room, he was the, bright, the brightest person who walked in the room. And not everybody agreed with that, at least initially. <laughs> uh, and, um, but when he becomes entangled in, in the, what, this famous Walgreen affair, I talk about it in the book, and then the Broyles affair, um, these affairs really came about because of challenges to the way we were teaching students. In other words, should, can you teach Karl Marx to students? Can you talk about, in the 1950s, Right. Communism in the classroom, and um, and in a way, the the students uh, knew enough about what was going on to insist that they had rights to learn, as well as the faculty having rights to teach. And I think Hutchins was deeply encouraged by the support that he got from the student body in both of these episodes. It was really quite extraordinary, uh, and not always to be taken for granted. And I think right. that really impelled him to, to to take the kind of bold and, and very kind of uh, risk averse moves that he did take. Well, I, I've heard you say, John, several times um, that the University of Chicago is a place where our undergraduate students respect and aspire to emulate the faculty, um, which is not always the situation in, yeah. at schools with lots of football teams and fraternities and yeah. parties and yeah. other things like that. I, and I, I must say that I, I've been impressed over my years here by how many students genuinely do admire what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, well, you know, I think, again, this is part of the, uh, we could have a kind of weak theory of history where we were destined in a providential way to have that kind of, uh, that kind <laughs> of consequence, which we have. But I think that it's also fair to say that the early student body was uh, a little bit different from most college student bodies in the end of the 19th century. First of all, it was men and women, and the early uh, female students actually were stronger academically than the male students. We know that from a, a variety. Of, so that, and since they kind of leavened the, uh, the student body and to, toward academic distinction. But you also have a student body that is actually, in many cases, filled with transfer students because people came here having gone to someplace else in the Midwest. Again, we were a regional place that wasn't very good, and this was a much better place. And so you had this convergence of very talented young people who had, an, uh, you know, whether they had the common sense or they were told they had the common sense to know that they should come here for uh, what we would call academic reasons, mm -hmm. but they did. And so, and then they met this faculty that was very intent on treating them as kind of young researchers because the whole structure of the college that Harper created was a, what I call a two plus two structure. The first two years were kind of general education, but the second two years were to train these college students to become graduate students, because where else would you get doctoral students in the right. 1890s and from, you'd have to train them. And right. it wasn't self-evident that you'd open your doors and have a bunch of really talented PhD students. And many of our departments, the majority of our graduates were undergraduates, so they had to be kind of trained up uh, through and, and kind of acculturated to this, uh, this life, life of the mind, as we would, might call it today. And so all of this then is put in place and flows forward What's remarkable is that the, that student culture flow, does flow forward because it, it could have gone away. You know, right. you can't take any culture for granted, and I think there are a series of, in a way, the invention of the core curriculum in the 30s is a way of kind of reconstituting and reinvesting in that, in that curriculum. In many of the things we've been doing in the last 30s, 30 years, you could say, as a, kind of a way of reinvesting and cultivating that student culture. It's, it's a very rare thing, and you could lose it if you lo lost it. It would be hard to get it back. Right, yeah. right, and and we seem to have been. Mm -hmm able to keep it and reinvent it and make it stronger and 
over and over. I, yeah, yeah. I was even, uh, I think it was very much on display in the last couple of years um, during the pandemic when we had to do so much teaching on Zoom. And I know that um, my core classes, which is the course for the incoming first year students that really helps to acculturate them and bring them up to what, uh, bring them into our, our uh, vision. Um, students were all over the globe on my Zoom screen. Um, and yet somehow they were, they were imbibing the, the right uh, stuff. And, and that actually brings me to a related point. At that moment, a decision was made to house the incoming students in accordance with their humanities core assignments, mm -hmm. um, which I, as an instructor, found very illuminating and mm -hmm. helpful. Can you talk a little bit about how these sorts of uh, intellectual, academic, administrative decisions get made? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I will have to give a shout out to my colleague, Chris Wilde, who's somewhere. I can't see him because of all the lights, but- He's right uh, there. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, we have, we're joined by other, uh, Administrators, I, I, I see uh, uh, Amanda Woodward and Mark Hansen. I mean, uh, uh, what, what's really quite wonderful about this place is, uh, in times of crisis, strong leaders emerge, to, to, uh, strong and enlightened, or people are willing to take mm -hmm. risks anyway. Uh, and uh, it was Chris's idea, and the faculty, more generally in the humanities, is that if you're, if you're going to bring people back, um, and you've, uh, you you want to worry about and, and think about having a kind of uh, Three, almost three-dimensional intellectual experience. We have, in a way, the core is a community of learning. What, what, what would happen if we had them live together, right. so that they could talk about Plato or Aristotle or Jane Austen or, you know, uh, Cindy Sherman, whatever, you know, in, 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 you know 24/7. Um, it was a, a great idea. It, it, it didn't have to work. It could have not worked, but it did work. Um, and I think, you know, it's kind of like an instantaneous tradition. I suspect 100 years from now we'll still be doing it. Um, so it was one of these COVID moments, and, you know, it's one of these things that had COVID happened, not happened, would we have done it? Right. I'm not sure, you know. I mean, that's kind of a what if. Um, right. But it's, uh, it does show you the power of residentiality. One of the things we've been doing the last 30 years is investing heavily in residential life. I think that uh, residence halls are not simply places where people sleep and you know, consume food, but mm -hmm. I think what we wanted to do was encourage these kind of intellectual communities, and right. what better way than to have people re read important books and, and talk about right. it after class. Yeah. Well, over yeah. Zoom, it was very impressive to see the students come together, and I had one student in China who would Zoom in with a couple of students in uh, Pilevsky to kind of catch up on everything, yeah, yeah. as they really felt they needed to be part of that. Yeah. So that was, I think that was a great experiment, Chris, and as you say, it's now an instant tradition. Um, yeah, I think it's great. And you've been uh, very instrumental in trying to do a number of things to make this residential experience so important for our students. We built uh, how many dorms under your? Uh, four. Four enormous dorms under your leadership. Um, and each one has been a place where <coughs> learning takes place. It's been important to you to have classrooms in the dormitories, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the, um, um, it's a fascinating story. I wasn't able to work it into the book because uh, my, my editor is over there. Good, then this you was, This was already a family-sized book, and so I, uh, 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 which they did not see as a compliment necessarily, but anyway. Uh, uh, I, I actually wrote a monograph about this because I was trying to get persuade the trustees to build uh, build these dorms, and um, it, you know it turns out that Harper and the early faculty wanted to do this, but they were busy founding the Oriental Institute and the History Department and the Psychology Department and the Political Science, and so they kind of ran out of money. And so, and the dorms that they built actually ended up being occupied mainly by graduate uh, women uh, because this was a very important. Place you, you had young women coming here to be graduate students from afar, whereas most of the college students could live at home, so they mm -hmm. were called streetcar kids. So we ended up approaching uh, residential life in a rather scattered way, uh, and it was really only after World War II when we had to go national and become much more competitive. And by that time, most of our peers had developed fully you know, organized and, and well organized residential systems, and we were playing catch up. But, you know, there is this wonderful saying that Gorbachev, uh, uh, in mourning the East German leadership in 1989, the history punishes those who come late. Well, it turns out it doesn't always punish right. who come late because we now have a, a, a quite wonderful modern system, uh, whereas most of our peers have old buildings that are, you know, need plumbing repairs. So it's, uh, you know, ours will need plumbing repairs too, but hopefully, you know, not, not for 
uh, our lifetimes anyway. So. Well, we've actually um, taken a little bit of pride in coming late to certain things and doing them better. Um, I think the arts is an example of that as well. Um, we did not have as robust an arts program um, as some of, our, uh, some of us wanted. And, and now we have an extraordinary program in, in all sorts of arts. Um, uh, the residential system, the study abroad system is another right. um, thing that has happened under your deanship yep. um, that we were not doing and that we wanted to do. And we've now done it in a distinctively University of Chicago way and I think far better than anybody else. You want to yeah, yeah. No, uh, uh, let me just say a little bit about the arts and, and the sure. study. You know, the arts uh, come late. Harper wanted to have them, but again, he, he, it's kind of like a you know, he just ran out of money. Uh, he wanted to have an engineering school too, and, and, and you know, he died before he could do that. Um, but we end up having the arts coming late. So, it, what happened in, in the twenties and thirties before you have the music and, and the art history department fully established again with German refugees as, as, as leaders and, and then this August institution coming into its own after World War II, is that you have a vibrant culture of student arts. And in, in a way, because the students had to start first, they gained a sense of independence that you still see in university theater today, of this kind of self-starting, uh, that uh, you have faculty who can help people be artistic, but an awful lot of the artistic practice on, among our students is, is really self-generated. Now, I think an associated in association and cooperation with the faculty. But so in, in a way, the, the coming late, I think, profited us because we then decided much later to, to, to invest in the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the faculty resources, but also we've been strengthening the student experience uh, and, and its autonomy. And I, and I think the autonomy is a very important component. Foreign study is uh, it's quite wonderful. You know, when I was an assistant professor, I still remember being appointed to a committee. I think it was by Jonathan Smith, who was the dean of the college at the time, on um, whether we should have foreign uh, study. Uh, the, the committee had three senior faculty, and then me as a lowly assistant professor. We had one meeting, uh, and I was told that um, <laughs> this was outrageous. That the, if you made it to the University of Chicago, you admit it to the greatest institution in the world. This, you know, the, 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 be dumbing down. Uh, these undergraduates would go to some beach in Australia and get drunk. And, uh, which is actually not <laughs> altogether improbable uh, for uh, perhaps other circumstances, but not ours. And so, uh, again, one of the things that happened in the 1990s is there were these group of younger humanists, uh, uh, younger at, at that point, more senior <laughs> now, uh, people like Philip Dazan, Robert Morrissey, and Francois Meltzer, mm -hmm. uh, who actually said, um, this is nuts. Like, you know, if, if you want people to learn French, you can certainly learn French in Cobb Hall, but you could also learn French in France, uh, and, or German in Germany, or whatever. And, uh, and, and if you could teach European history in Cobb Hall, you could certainly probably do just as good a job teaching European history in London or Vienna. Right. Uh, and it was the faculty initiative that really led to these programs uh, that you know, we were able to then you know, marshal and support for. And, and Martha remembers some of the senior faculty thought this. I was running Club Med Abroad. I remember one faculty member who was really down on me. You know, you're selling out, uh, you know, you're destroying the University of Chicago. And I said, uh, well, if it's so bad, why don't you go to this program, you can check up on me. And of course, the person went, had a great experience, and then she basically came back and said, you know, I, I, I kind of was wrong. Could I go back again? And I said, yeah, but you have to stop bad-mouthing our programs. In fact, I need you to be a patriot for me, as the Emperor Franz would have said. Uh, you, 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 you can be a patriot, but I want you to be a patriot for me. And um, luckily, this... So one thing led to another, and we know of, I think, probably the best... Uh, uh, foreign study uh, system in the Ivy Plus group. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, our study abroad programs are taught by our faculty exactly. to our students. Yeah. Um, so it's distinguished primarily yeah. by that. And there are courses. Exactly. Uh, well, uh, again, it's a way of putting together what seems to be obvious, but maybe at the time wasn't so obvious. The courses are largely core courses, and right. so the students can fulfill their core requirements. You know, students are quite naturally interested in fulfilling their requirements. But, and so it's a way of making the system work for us as opposed to trying to fight the, the broader curriculum and right. to kind of embrace the curriculum and make it work mm -hmm. for us. All right. So these are all things that we've done a little bit later than other people. Uh, we've learned from their mistakes, and uh, as you say, we've learned from our own students and our own faculty um, desires. So the residence um, system, the arts, the uh, study abroad, um, any other things that we've done a little bit later than others? Um, well, uh, I, you know, I think the, um, so, 
Sometimes the uh, coming light uh, works for you, sometimes it doesn't. So maybe I could talk a little bit about uh, coming light not working for us, and that's the whole area of philanthropy and fundraising, uh, which I've also written a monograph on, uh, which I worked a little bit into the book. But it's a, uh, so I, I, this was a, around the year 2000, 2001, the university had organized a fundraising campaign. You know, universities are always in campaign mode. Uh, and um, because of the controversy of, you know, in the Sonnenschein years, um, the, um, the uh, then leaders of the fundraising operation thought, well, maybe we should downplay the college because it's, it's, it's a kind of a, like a uh, third rail. If you mm -hmm. touch it, you mm -hmm. die. And so uh, we'll just um, talk about you know, the research university incorporated. I said, well, that's fine, except that uh, then it's kind of like it turning the colleagues in the college into like either the loyal or disloyal opposition. But, mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, I, again, I decided, well, maybe the thing to do would be go back into the archives and see if there's a story there. And it turns out that the um, university profited enormously from the beneficence of the Rockefellers. I mean, Rockefeller was a, an extraordinary philanthropist, not only in, the, in the, the level of his contributions, but also that he was a hands-off type of person. And mm -hmm. So Harper was able to do what he needed to do uh, without you know, the Rockefellers, either the father, the son, or, or later generations kind of meddling and telling us how to you know, run the University of Chicago. Um, but at a certain point, after let's say 90, almost $100 million of, of those dollars, uh, the Rockefellers decided it's, it's done, it's over. And I, I mentioned in my book a, a letter that uh, John D. Rockefeller, or actually it was the chairman of the Rockefeller Foundation, sent to Hutchins in the 1930s saying basically, you know, it's, it's been great knowing you, but like, mm -hmm. good luck. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there are many other sources of revenue or philanthropy, and the university was uh, really paralyzed. It, it took a number of I would say almost decades to kind of come out from under this reliance so heavily on the philanthropy of one family. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after the war, we became very much reliant on the philanthropy of the big foundations, you know, Ford uh, and, and others. And so and we, we neglected to organize our own, our own people, our own alumni, uh, and to work with them in a, in a way that I think would have been constructive and positive. It wasn't that there were not efforts, but they were not really systematic in the way that many of our peers would do. I think, I think we've done a lot better now in the last 30 years. Uh, but that's an example of something coming late that doesn't always work out right. in such a positive the, way. I, th I think you know, it's been turned around, but 30 years ago, we, we, the university was still feeling it, that. Right. And it's hard to catch up on yeah, that yeah. once you lose that, as you say. Yeah. When you lose uh, the momentum, it's very hard yeah. to pick it back up. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the writing of the book itself, John. Um, and as I said earlier, you are both a participant and a historian um, in this book. Um, you very carefully leave your name out. Um, a couple places, you, this writer does something um, very modest. Um, do you think that this book um, is um, deeply informed by your own experience? And would it be, very, would it be different if an outsider were to begin to write this? Yeah, that, that's a fascinating question, and, and uh, 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 you can tell Martha's a very careful reader. I, I, I don't know how many people who read the book would have figured that one out, but, uh, and, I, I, and I thought for several days about what, how to, to, to write that line. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I, I could not have written this book if, if I had not had this, this job, you know, the, 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 what I call the day job, uh, uh, or, or the, the part-time, part full-time job of being dean. Um, not only because being dean, I had access to a lot of archives, uh, because you know anybody can, not every you know, people can get access to archives if they want, but also it was a, a, really an attempt to see and to learn from so many people who were actually kind of practicing administrators, who were, who were scholars who became practicing administrators who then went back, and to you, you get a sense of the kind of the, the living life of the community, the sense of contingency, the, how things happen, how things don't happen, uh, sometimes for better or worse. Um, I. I Use the word courage. How you know the the, the the difficulty to run an institution, and the courage that it takes to make the decisions that need to be. And so I was able to kind of see all of this, and kind of take it in. And um, it was kind of for me a kind of Henry Jamesian moment. You know, you uh -huh. can, and eventually I thought, well, I have the, the you have these arch the university has extraordinary archives. I, I I think it's Bob Rosenthal or other people who created these things, and um, and so it, it was a time to. To, to do what Ralph Lerner urged me to do, namely to you know write it all down. Uh, I, I think it, it it would have been very hard to do this had, had I not been involved in some you know some way in helping to run the place. But that said, it's it, it's a very interesting problem of of 
the early chapters are really, you know, deep mm -hmm. history, but when you start writing about people who are alive right. uh, and who can actually say, no, you got this totally wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember talking to some colleagues, uh, kind of informal oral history, and, you know, like I, I have this memo from 1975, you know, what were you, I didn't write that memo. No, no excuse me, like I have the memo. Like, really? I, did, I wrote the, yeah, I, you wrote the memo. Like, what were you thinking? Well, I don't remember. And, and then, what, them wanting me to tell them what they were thinking because I actually probably knew more about what they th were thinking than they did. Uh, uh, so it became a, a really a fascinating exercise in kind of living in the laboratory of almost kind of public history. Yeah, yeah. all right. Is, if you were to go back and write another chapter, is there a chapter or a topic that you feel now you had to leave out um, that you'd like to, um, that could have been productive? Um, well, you know, the, the university is, um, it, it's, it's a young university, but not that young. It's about 130 some years old. And um, I, when the book was first published, I, I had a number of people would come up and say, you know, well, uh, I enjoyed the book and so forth, but you, you, you left out mm -hmm. this department or that department. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, I, 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 trying to be you know, respectful of their, their position, which I understood, uh, I said, you know, well, the, the, there is a modern history of the University of Oxford. I think it's 12 volumes. Now, Oxford has got more centuries right. than we do. They have uh, more archives. And more, more arch <laughs> well, yeah, somewhat more archives and, and, and more traditions and probably more myths, too. We have a lot of myths. Uh, but I think that, uh, in, in a way, uh, this is the kind of the book that I wanted to write, but I hope that other people will write books as well. You know, Edward Levy, our former president, once said this wonderful thing that nobody owns this place, we all own it, which means we're all responsible for it and we're all accountable to it, and we all have to preserve its values in, in the way that we can, in the way that we were able to. Uh, so, but you know, to your point, the, um, uh, you know, we've talked about this before, the, the, the kind of the turning point or the fulcrum in the book is the chapter on Hutchins. It's over 100 mm -hmm. pages long. Hutchins was by far the most controversial single leader we've ever had. And, and in some ways, I would say the, you know, one of the most creative and bravest, but also <laughs> mm -hmm. one of the ones who, in a sense, created the modern university and then almost destroyed the modern university. And so I found it, in writing about him, uh, it was a very difficult and tricky thing because one wanted to be fair uh, without kind of imposing my own judgment on, you know, the, on the, the, I would say the negative consequences of, the, of his presidency. So uh, I think if I were to do the chapter again, I, I might <laughs> rethink some of the judgments I made. Uh, uh, at least I, I, I would probably ask myself to, to rethink them uh, because it, it, was, uh, it was at a time when we were simply trying to rebuild the college. And, and in a way, Hutchins, the Hutchins College is the college we have, but it, he almost destroyed it. And so it, it, it's almost this Greek tragic sense mm -hmm. of... Uh, so that I would probably redo. The other thing that's been pointed out to me is I, I left out athletics totally, except the abolition of the football team. <laughs> and so, I, uh, uh, you know, maybe one can have a go at that again. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't realize. I also didn't realize that. Well, um, before I turn it over to the audience, I have one last question for you, John. Um, you have a book coming out this year from Oxford University Press on the Hofstra monarchy. Um, which was more difficult to write, the Hofstra Empire or the University of Chicago? Uh, um, it, it, it was, um, uh, well, the Hofstra have all these emperors. You have to keep them, <laughs> you have to make sure you don't confuse them. Uh, and and the, the cover of the book has three of them. So, the, and I hope you'll, if, if you don't buy the book, you'll at least find the cover amusing. Um, <laughs> uh, they're very different books. Uh, each book is a different kind of, Enterprise, uh, uh, in a way, the um, you know the, the, the Austrian book or the Habsburg book is an attempt to chart the history of a society that was glorious and brilliant, you know, von der Sick, La Freud, Mahler, and so forth. That that then again almost destroyed itself in World War One, and then destroyed the Jewish community in the 1930s, and then had to kind of in in some way rebuild itself with you know billions of dollars of Marshall Plan aid. And so, in a way, it's this kind of very dramatic story of rise and fall. And in, in some ways, it's not unlike the history of our university. That, uh, and, and so there, there, there are certain parallels. The other um, thing that I, I, to come back to something at the very beginning, you said, you know, one of the things that these great European states, that's true for the French and the British and the Germans and the Austrians and the Italians, it, these countries, in a sense, can endure regime change and, you know, better or worse politicians because they have excellent civil services that actually can... You know, who runs the German state today? Well, it's a civil service. It's, you know, it's not, and, and really smart politicians in any of these 
countries would admit that right away. And in some ways, it's the, the staff and the, 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 you know, the faculty, amateur leadership who have kept this place going so consistently. They're, they're the kind of unsung heroes. And, and in some ways, the, um, you know, it, it's difficult to write about administrative assistants or secretaries or department chairs for a year or two. But, but the, 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 the web, the, the fabric of our university has really been constituted and defended by all of these kind of permanent and semi-permanent staff that have made it possible for the faculty and the, and the students to do what we do best. Uh, and I think they, uh, they deserve a great deal of credit. Right, and that's a great parallel. Thank you. Well, I'll turn the, um, uh, the mic over. I'll open the floor to questions. We have questions from our audience on Zoom as well. So we, and we have some people in the audience walking around with um, uh, microphones. So um, let me start with a few questions, please, from the audience. See a hand uh, back there. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Russell Hatch. I am an alum of the college. Uh, I just spent the last 27 years in New York. I don't know, I'm a, a AB, I think we say, uh, 1991. And so I just missed your tenure, but I'm sure that you were, you've been extraordinary. We're still here, right? Um, I just returned to Hyde Park, and I just thinking about what you said about Hutchins, I'd like to say that as long as when I was in New York, if I was the only college graduate in the room, I assumed I was the smartest person in the room. And uh, along those lines, I, uh, you spoke about um, the evolving college, and it always seemed a question about size and how big it was going to be. When I was here, it seemed there was this wistfulness about the Hutchins years and how terrible any expansion had ever been, except if it hadn't expanded, I probably wouldn't have been a student here. So all that being said, I've always been amazed, at least anecdotally what I know about universities, that the college compared to the size of the university is small. It's, at least as, when I remember being here, it was about uh, one college student for every two graduate professional students here. And every other university I've been affiliated with was just the opposite. And, and there's a question in there somewhere, uh, if, if you'd like to comment. Thank you. Okay, um, so um, you're right that uh, we, we, we were and still are small, I mean, not so small, but uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not the University of Texas or even Cornell. Uh, and and what, what's interesting is the, um, you know, I, I just paid tribute a few minutes ago to the you know, wonderful early students we had, women and men who actually, uh, undergraduates who actually helped, helped create the culture that we value. But, you know, when Harper started, um, uh, he, he was very, uh, he's this heroic figure, you know, William Rainey Harper, I think his name is on everything, or a lot of things. Uh, and um, uh, he, he was a little bit ambivalent about having too many undergraduates for precisely the reason, well, you know, we want this to be a graduate, you, you know, the, the normative student was really a PhD student for Harper, but, but he was practical enough to know that you couldn't just go to, to, to the prairies of Iowa and find these people. You, you, you needed to kind of, you had to have undergraduates, and then it was pointed out to him, not the least by the Rockefeller folks in New York, that undergraduates do pay tuition, and, and you know, and that, that's not an occasional thing to dismiss. And so, by Harper's the time of his death, we actually had a, a larger college than he thought, and then you know it went along. Uh, by World War II, we, if you look at the our peers, we were about the same size as Harvard and Yale and Stanford. We all had about 3,000, 3,200 students. And then, um, you know, they keep going up after World War II because of the GI Bill and because of the, uh, the Ivies going co-ed. And we went in the opposite direction. We started going down because of um, decisions that Harper, uh, Hutchins had made about the curriculum and so forth that, you know, he basically couldn't sell to the American people. It was too bad that he, And so, uh, in a way, we, I think by 1954, we were down to about 1,200 students. And, wow. uh, and, and this is a... A dangerous situation right. uh, for the university, not only because of the alumni population and tuition, but because, it, as you say, if you don't have a, an undergraduate college of a certain size, you lack vibrancy, you lack the kind of uh, 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 the enthusiasm that young learners bring to, that convey to old, older learners. And so uh, that's why when I went into the archives in 1996, I found every president since Harp Hutchins actually worrying about this kind of paralyze as to what to do about it because it's not something you can just turn around and you know, make it go away and you know, let's bring back the, the good old days. And it's taken the work of decades to make this work and a lot of the, there are a lot of people in this room who have, who have made, made it happen. 
I, I think we're, we, we now have a college that's about 7,000 students. It's about roughly half of the university. They, we have very strong doctoral and professional programs and thr thriving MA programs. My own view, for what it's worth, is that I think it's probably about the right size. I don't think we should get any bigger. Uh, uh, I don't think we should probably get any smaller. But it, 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 if we had not done what we did over the last 30 years, I think the university would have been in very, very yeah. serious financial difficulties and, right. and other kinds of difficulties as well. And, and, and you know, that's, that, right. that's, just, that's, my, that's my view, anyway. Right. Thank you. I, I'm, the lights are in my eyes, so. Um, ah, OK. All right. Thank you. If the U.S. enters a war, how will that change universities in America today, given what we've learned from history? Well, we've actually, um, uh, if, if you just set aside the Spanish-American War, which was like a little war, uh, you know, we, we, we were a university during World War I, we were a university during World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, uh, and the, all of these, um, Wars have had a, uh, perhaps setting aside Korea, uh, had really a profound Vietnam. impact on our history. Uh, Vietnam, certainly. Uh, uh, so it, wars affect universities, and universities affect wars. Uh, and um, in the Vietnam War, the, the, uh, uh, the, all of the tensions that were prevalent on, on many university campuses were present on this campus, but because of our particular student culture and faculty culture, I think they were even more intense. And um, the... Um, and, uh, and it was a very hard time. It was a hard time to run the university. It was a hard time to be a student at the university. I, I happen to be here as, in, in both roles. Uh, uh, what, what can the university do to prevent war? Uh, you know, I mean, w one of the wonderful things that Hushins did, and, and this is, is very characteristic of the guy, after the war, uh, war in which he pre had presided over the Manhattan Project and then helped to create an atomic bomb, which he did not want Truman to use, and, you know, signed the famous plea to him, to the president not to use it, which was you know, ignored. Uh, he then spends money, which we didn't have, to assemble a faculty group to write a constitution for the world. And this is a wonderful story that I mention a little bit in the book. I have another essay that I did. Uh, I, you know, dismissing the, the efficacy or the, the, the likelihood that the UN was going to work. It was as if, like, you know, that's not going to work, so we'll sit down and convene a faculty group at the University of Chicago to write a constitution for world, which they then proceeded to publish with the University of Chicago Press, and which got a lot of flight, you know, for a while, and then life went on. Uh, and so, uh, you know, universities do have a, uh, I think they can be opportunistic in a very good way. If wars come, we're going to have to reckon with them, uh, and, and, and I hope the current uh, unrest and, and violence that's happening in, in, in the Ukraine, you know, doesn't get worse. I, I fear it may. Uh, and, and we need to you know, react to that. But I think uh, we should be cognizant of the fact that this is a university that has been impacted by war, but it has also been, in, in a sense, grown and learned and, and become more mature by the experiences of going through wars. And, and in certain <clears throat> ways has um, benefited from the crises in that we have welcomed scholars who have been displaced by um, global crisis and wars, um, and they have been enormously influential in the history of the university. They, they did, and, and, and that's a really interesting story. You know, the, the, um, you know, the, 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 um, the, 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 uh, the Jewish refugees and, and some non-Jewish refugees who ended up here, um, and, you know, how they were assimilated into the place, because by the late 40s, late 30s, we were already sufficiently distinguished. We could say, well, what do we need those people for? We might have taken pity on them, you know, in a charitable way, but actually, no, they were embraced, and, 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 and this, this flow of, of international talent, and it may be the, the sad and tragic circumstances that are unfolding now in Europe will, right. you know, give us more such people. Uh, you know, I, I hope for the, for the sake of the Ukraine that doesn't happen, but it may. Uh, and, uh, but certainly the, 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 the refugees uh, who came in the 40s, and even until the late 40s, had a very profound effect on including, I mean, this institution. This institution, which we, certainly. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you for that question. Um, another question from Zoom um, asks, what are the modern day influences on the core curriculum? And how might these, they, the core curricula, maybe, change over time? Modern influences on the yeah, core. Yeah, uh, well, you know, um, uh, Mar Martha has the, um, the honor uh, and privilege of holding a chair in honor of, in the name in honor of Chauncey Boucher. Uh, and Boucher was actually the dean of the college who helped to create the core curriculum. 
It was actually Boucher's idea, not Hutchins. I, I'm, I'm, by the way, answering this question. I'm just That's so fine. Uh, and, um, but Boucher was a very sincere guy, but he couldn't sell it. So Hutchins uh -huh. could sell things, and so they were an interesting kind of partnership. And um, Boucher had the idea that um, uh, if you're going to have a core, uh, it should encompass the whole university. Hence, we should have a science core and a, you know, this core and that kind of core, not just in the humanities, as, uh, as was happening at Columbia with, with contemporary civilization. Um, and, um, and basically, that the core, if it's going to be encompass all of the disciplines in an interdisciplinary way, it has to come out of the latest scholarship and the latest thinking. And so, in a way, and this, it was not a great books curriculum. I guess that's what I want to say. Hushes disagreed with that, and that's how, in some ways, St. John's comes to be founded by people who we brought here and then who were kind of chased away by the faculty. Um, so general education is not the same as great books. And general education in the 30s is different from the 90s and probably from the 2010s. Why? Well, because it's coming out of the faculty. And so the, I think what people need to understand is that the core will only be successful and ultimately will only survive to the extent that it has the commitment and buy-in by the then faculty leaders, junior, senior, whatever, in, 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 thought leaders. Um, and so that as you know, books change, as ideas change, as new patterns of scholarship emerge that's bound to be uh, created, uh, have an impact on the core. If, and I think that's a good thing. Now, oftentimes at reunion, you'll have people come back and say, well, you know, are, are you still reading so-and-so in the core? Well, you know, maybe not. I mean, I, I, I always joke I've read Thucydides 112 times, and, and you know, some of our core courses use Thucydides, but not all. And so, thanks. well, that's too bad. But No, but they're reading other good books, or they're reading other important books. And so... Uh, and it's in that sense that it's a, it's a living thing uh, shaped by the men and the women who are teaching it now within the framework of interdisciplinarity. It's not owned by any de department. The faculty who teach and teach by virtue of being appointed in the college, not in the graduate divisions. The, the, those, these administrative arrangements are, are rather important. Mm -hmm. And the, the small intimate size of small classes, you know, where you get to know the students mm -hmm. and, and have you know, the expectations of their performance. And see, the, the, those are constants, but but, uh, you know, I think the news for the alumni is 50 years from now, it's probably going to be a different animal than it is now, and, and that's probably a good thing. So, in terms Yeah, we'll have some of the same books. Some of the same, but... And some of the same goals, I hope. Yeah, well, I, the goals will be the same, right. but the, 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 the route to those goals may be a little okay. different. Yeah. One more question? Questions from the audience? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, that I found breathtaking about your book was just frankly, you alluded to this earlier, was just how dire the financial straits were the university early on. I mean, it just was not a very wealthy. I'm surprised, frankly, to be honest, having read that part of your book, that this university survived, frankly, yeah. given, given the challenges, the lack of fundraising, the lack of support, the Rockefeller family finally saying, hey, enough is enough, this is it. You know, and I'm just wondering, do you think, and, and, and I, I, let's just take, for example, that let's just say hypothetically that the academic culture here is unique compared to the East, East Coast peers who were in, uh, in business 100 years prior to this university. Do you think that, <laughs> and I'm just asking this innocently, actually, the lack of uh, financial management was perhaps a byproduct of just how, you know, it's, it's, it's heritage from, uh, you know, basically a different model of a university that was born out of Europe led it to have a financial history that was so different from the other East Coast schools, which frankly, that's the other breathtaking thing, is how, how wealthy these East Coast schools are. I mean, it's just breathtaking. It's how, how unwealthy this school has been and how wealthy those are. Those are two breathtaking uh, zeniths to look at, frankly. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, no, uh, I, I, think, I think you're right in several respects. Uh, 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 universities are not businesses, but they have to pay their bills. Uh, and I guess I would, you know, so we're not in the business of making money, but we're in the business of using resources productively to advance our, you know, our, our, our larger educational uh, and research uh, uh, aspirations. Um, you know, if you look at the history of our endowment, by the, well into the 1950s, we were among the three or four top endowments in the United States. I mean, we were not the wealthiest university, but we were a very, you know, well cared for, and, and because, you, the, because of the Rockefellers, and because I, also the support of local civic elites who, who did contribute. I mean, not all of the buildings on this campus are named for Rockefellers, they're named for wealthy, successful women and men, many of our early donors were, 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 were women, who, you know, civic leaders in Chicago who gave us support as well. Um, and um, so in a way, I think, you know, um, you don't have to be the wealthiest person. Uh, and, and, and in some ways, that's not even 
a good thing to be, but you need the resources to, to, to avoid mediocrity. This is a place that really is very, very, not only skeptical of it, just detests mediocrity. It really excels, excels in ambition and excellence. Uh, and you need the resources to, to achieve those goals. It was really in the 1950s that things began to go bad uh, because of the collapse of college enrollments and, the, um, and then the, the um, in a way, what, what they got into. And I, I didn't realize this. You know, we had a large graduate population, but as Martha and the other divisional deans will know, I mean, for many, many decades, we were using our, under, our graduates as, as, as proxy undergraduates because they had to pay a lot of tuition. Mm -hmm. We had a very anemic system of fellowships for, for our doctoral students because, right. they, in a sense, they were the undergraduates who were paying tuition because we didn't have the undergraduates who would pay tuition. And so the, the place got into a, a kind of vortex of uh, kind of living, uh, you know, from one year to another trying to you know, maintain the excellence and, the, uh, and, and its aspirations. Uh, and I think that, you know, this is what Hannah Gray recognized. This is what Hugo Sonnenschein recognized. I, I make the argument in the book that the two presidencies, Gray's and Sonnenschein's, are actually part one and two of the same presidency yeah, in a way. Uh, even though they were very different personalities, both great leaders and both, uh, I take it as, uh, they were my friends and I admired them both. But uh, I'm not sure they would have thought they were the two parts of the same uh, presidency, but they were both very, very self-conscious in the need to rebuild our financial our, our, our resources, which meant rebuilding the college and and the uh, and then uh, and, and 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 you know the support that the college could bring. Uh, happily, that you know we've made some progress in that along those lines. Um, I'm looking at my minders. Okay. Um, well, there's a great deal more we could talk about um, the role of the university in the city of Chicago. Um, occupied a couple of my index cards here, and we didn't get to it. Um, but I want to thank all of you in the room and on Zoom. Um, I hope that this um, conversation has given you a deeper appreciation for the history of the University of Chicago, and especially for the greatness and the importance of its leaders, um, like John Boyer. So please join me in thanking John Boyer for his book. <laughs> And please join us out in the lobby where John will be signing copies of this book. And I hope um, it makes a great um, gift. So Mother's Day is coming up. Or, or a doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. And thank you to those at home.